I know a guy who went to a florist school so he could develop his, his abilities as a florist to make this place. His, his old man owned a florist shop and he got that on the GI Bill and, and so forth. That was a tremendous input. So these two things, a back, backlog of buying power, wanting cars and, and houses and, and people, school, and plus the professional training, the development and expansion of productive skills and opportunities as never before, as billions were poured into the economy. That's what gave us, that's what gave us the prosperity that we know about today. That's the prosperity that people talk about it as if we had it ever since James Madison, which we didn't. It's a short frame of period. It was from 1946 to about 1980. From 1980 on, there's been a slow and gradual unraveling. The standard of living in this country is still higher than it is in certain other countries where the poor are getting poorer even faster to some degree. Third world again. Um, but that, that really is what the prosperity is. It's a very febrile, tentative, um, and particularistic thing that came with this composition of forces after World War II. America was not really such a, 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 such a great and prosperous country. And by the 1950s, you had a situation where a college graduate could graduate from a, a four-year college with a C minus average and yet get a job that gave him enough money to put a down payment on a small little house, buy a car, and have a wife who stayed at home and got <coughs> pregnant. Uh, this was, and that was another thing. That was another thing, and now that you mention it, the third component, babies, that everybody came home and started, um, and the boys really wanted to make up for lost time, and there was, Oh, there was a whole baby pregnancy industry, diaper care, this care, your baby talcum powders, this, that, the other thing, your cribs, that, be happy, have a nice house, mommy with a baby, get, get out of the defense plan, you women thought you had a career in the line, out, get back into the house and the like. Um, and consume, and the consuming led to more production, so it became high production, high consumption, high consumption fed production. And that gave us that gave, gave us this prosperity that we think we have. By the 1970s, millions were working eight-hour days, had job security, paid vacations, <clears throat> time and a half overtime, <clears throat> company medical insurance, and fairly adequate retirement pensions. Many lived in decent housing, and even could pay a mortgage on a house of their own. Remember when houses were something you could afford? Do you remember that? <laughs> Ask your parents about it. Well, their kids went to public school and some even to public universities. So you might have a machinist in an auto factory has a good union, he has a good rate of pay. He could, he could, have, he could actually, a machinist, a working guy now, could live the American middle class dream. He could have a little house, a little car, and he, his kid could go to school, and, 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 and so forth. <clears throat> the plutocracy wondered, and they really wondered aloud, where will this end? These people want this, you give them this, they want that, they want that. You don't give it to them, and they fight and struggle, and they strike, and there's contract struggles in the fight and, and, uh, and lockouts and all that sort of thing. Uh, that's how they got it, uh, some of it. I should say, you know, the, the union struggle during the New Deal was another breakthrough. That, that too, with the Wagner Act, the Magna Carta, which said unions are legal for the first time in American history because unions were always suppressed by the U.S. courts. They were called, in the 19th century, they were called combinations. And combinations were seen as a taking of property, an expropriation of the owner's wealth by this combination. You're calling for a wage that isn't the market, natural wage, a wage that you demand, otherwise you will, in unified fashion, withhold your labor in a strike that was all considered illegal and a violation of the, of the property rights of the country. Uh, now that was changed with the Wagner Act. Um, and so unions got stronger, Unions getting stronger, so did economic democracy. 
So the plutocrats did say, where is this going to end? As the common lot of employees advances, so do their expectations. The better off they become, the still better off they want to be, it seemed. <clears throat> and more for the general populace means less for the privileged few. By the late 1970s, it looked like this country might end up as a quasi-egalitarian social democracy like in Western Europe, or worse, uh, 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 a collectivist, a socialist kind of thing, unless something was done about it. Paul Volcker, anybody remember who Paul Volcker is? Yeah. Paul Volcker was, uh, who the hell was Paul Volcker? Oh. <laughs> um, Paul Volcker, yeah, it's called, it's called, you'll be there someday if you live long enough. <laughs> Paul Volcker was head of the Federal Reserve. The big, the big guy, what Alan Greenspan of uh, Vernon he is now. Paul Volcker said when he was chair of the Federal Reserve in 1980, Quote, the standard of living of the average American has to decline. Isn't that amazing comment? I mean, it's wonderful when they, they say it. They actually come out. They come out. They don't say, it. we're here to serve you. We're all married. We're all in the same boat. The rising tide. Well, when he comes out, he says, that the standard of living for the average American has to decline. He didn't say the standard of living of Paul Volcker has to decline. He didn't say the standard of living of Paul Volcker's friends in the country club has to decline. No, he said the average American, you folks down there, and decline it has. Starting in then, right around 1980, with the advent of the Ronald Reagan administration, two decades of reactionary rollbacks to undo the gains won in the 1930s with the New Deal, undo the gains won in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. An increase, we have seen it, an increase in poverty and homelessness. We didn't used to have homeless people on the streets. There were no homeless people until Ronald Reagan got into office. He started shutting down all the mental institutions and throwing them out on the streets. You didn't have homeless. You, you, you younger people sort of accept that as just part of the urban landscape, but we never, we didn't see that in the old days. Maybe in New York, occasionally you'd find a wino down in the Bowery sleeping in a, in a doorway, but that was like very unusual. Now, where I live in Berkeley, California, you walk down the street, it's like, uh, it cost me a dollar and a half to walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not so funny. I mean, if the hands are out in every other block, there's somebody there. And um, what am I going to say? Uh, oh, shape up and go to college. You know, I, I think you can, you know. Substandard housing and substandard schools. They say that public, public education, public schools don't work. You know what you do, you defund the schools and then they don't work. Right. Um, Longer work days with no overtime pay, work and benefit cutbacks, a growing tax burden increasingly shifted onto the backs of the lower and middle class. Did you see the article in today's USA Today, how the IRS is spending more time auditing small and middle-sized businesses and leaving the giant corporations alone? Even though the return per hour of work was, was three or four times greater, by auditing a big corporation. Obviously, they got bigger operations. They steal more, they got more money, more places to hide it, and, and the like. Um, uh, but for some reason, <clears throat> for some reason, the head of the IRS, appointed by um, George Bush, is himself a CEO of a, a large corporation. Um, <clears throat> wage and benefit cutbacks, a, uh, uh, fewer, if any, vacation days, inadequate health care, millions more without affordable health insurance, or with health insurance that doesn't really insure, and doesn't really work. Did any of you see Michael Moore's movie, Sicko? Oh, if you haven't seen it, get the DVD, it's marvelous. And it's, and it's a very, and it's funny too, and it's very moving.